Well, hello, everybody. It's good to see your faces tonight, this midweek service. Let's rise. Come before the Lord. I, uh, hey, what a great day it was. Beautiful weather tomorrow, I think 70, somewhere around 70, 71. And yes, the Lord is faithful. I, I love the change of the seasons. And, uh, you know, God speaks to us through all the seasons. He's always with us. And we know the rain falls on the just and the unjust. But we have a heavenly father who looks down upon us and loves us so much. Father, we thank you that we can come tonight in this midweek service to worship you, Lord. And to praise you and to set our minds on you. We welcome you in this place, Lord. And we are hungry for you. We cry that your Holy Spirit would fall on these grounds. So we worship you and give you all the glory. Let's worship our King.
just come before holy God Lord as we sell our minds and worship you we give you the praise Lord, for who you are
It's so good to be with you guys tonight. So good to see your faces. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hey, let's greet someone. We'll uh, begin our evening study. Well, we're really early tonight. It's only 10 of 6 on the clock back there. It's, it's changing to daylight savings time earlier, a little bit each day or something. So welcome to Calvary Chapel of Marlton this Wednesday evening, March 10th. We'll go through a few announcements before we continue. Uh, tonight is uh, Wednesday, March 10th, as we said. The next event activity thing to do that we have coming up after tonight here at Calvary Chapel is the Young Adults Bible Study, which meets this Friday night in two days. Downstairs on the lower level, in person at 7.30 p.m. We'll be studying the Gospel of John, continuing our study there. We'll be in John chapter 4 this week. Uh, the Ladies Sunday School then kicks off our Sunday morning festivities here, 8 o'clock. They meet on Zoom, and you can let us know if you'd like to get in on that, and we can send you to the right person to tell you how to do that. Um, at 9.30 Sunday morning, we have the prayer meeting, and at 10 o'clock, service begins. Uh, looking ahead, uh, Lord willing, if the weather cooperates, uh, we should be back out on the front lawn again the first week of April. That's what our goal is. That's Easter Sunday. So, uh, if the, boy, it's going to be, it's great this week. If we could get this kind of weather in April, you know what they say about March, in like a lion, out like a lamb. We're hoping it came in like a lamb and goes out like a lamb. But uh, that's the goal anyway. So you, so you know the goal. We actually ordered brand new tents today because the tents were kind of beat up. One of them we actually threw out. So uh, we're going to be getting new TVs for out there because we managed to beat them up also last year. So we're trying to get everything ready so that we can be out on the front lawn the first week of April. Anyway, uh, in the more immediate future, next Monday, March 15th, we'll be back here again for the Christian Foundations class, week three. Then the ladies' Bible study meets next week, Wednesday morning and Thursday evening, studying the book of Revelation. And of course, also next week, we have the Wednesday night a Bible study again right back here same time same place so we have things going on Friday night Sunday morning Monday night Wednesday morning Wednesday night Thursday night if that's not enough choices for you then there's no hope for you after that the uh, men's Bible study will be the following Saturday March 20th at 9 a.m. right here on the lower level and that's also available on Zoom, if you care to join us that way. 
Also, our missions conference, first ever missions conference. This was a total God thing, the way this whole all came about. I won't share all the details now, uh, but it, it, was, it was a God thing, and we're happy to be having it. We're excited about it. We hope you'll put on your calendars Saturday morning, uh, 9 to 1. We're going to have three different teachings taught by a fellow that started Shepherd Staff Missions Facilitators. His name is Jeff Jackson. And uh, he's done a lot of interesting mission things around the world. So uh, we're looking forward to that. In June, we'll be having our apologetics conference. More details to come on that. And the lobby does have the latest edition of Calvary Chapel magazine. And it's the last one we have. We don't have any more to give out until they send us another one. So uh, get it while it's hot. So Pastor Lauren's going to come up and continue studying the book of Amos. Lauren? Right, Amos chapter 7. We're going to start tonight in verse 10. You want to put your finger in the place. But let's pray. Lord, we've assembled ourselves here together tonight to be in your presence. We pray that you would bless us tonight. We, we can say with Job that we treasure the words of your mouth more than our necessary food. And Lord, ever since you lit that fire in us, we've been hungering for you. We find you in your word and we, we just want to thank you for this wonderful thing that you've done in saving each one of us and bringing us together in a body of love. Mutual service, edifying one another. And this is just a wonderful thing, wonderful blessing. Lord, teach us your word tonight and equip us that we could be better servants of you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. We're in chapter 7. Starting at verse 10, uh, this is the section of Amos's book that relates five visions that Yahweh caused Amos to see. God called Amos to be his prophet, his mouthpiece, his spokesperson. Like we saw last time, prophecy is primarily forth-telling. Speaking forth the words of God. That's what a prophet is. A subset of foretelling is foretelling. Predicting what will happen in the future. You know, we generally, when we hear the word prophecy, we think of things to come. Predictions of the future. The end times. And that's, that's all true. But primarily... The, the prophet was the person who spoke the words of God. He delivered the message of God. That's what Amos was. Amos was like all the true prophets who stood in the council of God. He, was, he received his messages in the, in the council of God. He could only proclaim that which the Lord gave him to say. We pointed, he pointed out that in back in uh, chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. Amos said this, he said, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. A lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken. Who can but prophesy? I think it was Jeremiah that said, I said I was going to shut up. But the word of God was like a fire in my bones. He had to, he had to speak it forth.
No prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man. But holy men of God, separated out men of God, spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Amos was ordained by God, he was called by God, and he stood in the counsel of God to receive his message. His prophetic voice spoke to Israel of the past, of the present, and of the future. He was given both words to speak, and he was given visions to relate. Last time, <clears throat> we covered the first three of these visions, starting in uh, verse 1 with the vision of the all-consuming swarms of locusts. A graphic mind picture of what was to come. Namely, hordes of Assyrian locusts sweeping over the land, devouring everything in their path. Amos has already stated this in plain words in the last chapter. In uh, that's chapter 6, in verse 14, he says, Behold, I will raise up a nation against you, O house of Israel, says the Lord God of hosts, and they will afflict you from the entrance of Hamath to the valley of the Arabah. Which is to say the whole land of promise from its extreme northern border to its southern border. And back in chapter 5, verse 27 he had said, therefore, I will send you into captivity beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. This is plain speaking. He, sp he spoke it out in plain words. And there's nothing ambiguous here. The Israelites know full well what is beyond Damascus. It's the Syrian, the Assyrian Empire. These guys are the terrorists of the ancient world. They're like all devouring locusts, and they're on there working their way uh, westward toward the Mediterranean because they're sucking up all that territory, and Israel's right in the way. In the next vision, Amos saw the all consuming fire of God's legal case against the apostate people of God. God litigates with fire. Now, this is a fire that drinks up the ocean and scorches a portion of the earth in the vision. And apparently, in the vision, would have consumed everything if not for the prophet's interception, inter intercession. I guess that is an interceptor. It's <laughs> if God relented. This happened in the first vision of the locusts as well. The prophet makes intercession for the people and God relents. We won't see this pattern repeated in the next three visions. Because even though his mercy endures forever, his gracious gift of forgiveness it has to be received. Isaiah chapter 30. Verse 15 says this. For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength but you would not. Israel must return to the covenant. But Isaiah says, but you would not. 
Those are some of the saddest words in Scripture. And you can hear the pathos in the voice of God speaking through the prophet. Those same words come around again in Scripture. Somewhere around 780 years in the future of this prophecy, Jesus coming to present himself as the rightful heir to the throne of David says in Matthew chapter 23, starting at verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not. See, your house is left to you desolate, and I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He's coming again. Israel rejected their, you know, they rejected their Messiah. They rejected the prophet Amos. <laughs> they rejected all the prophets. There'll come a day in their exile. They're going to come to their senses. That hardness of heart is going to be lifted. They're going to recognize the one that they pierced as their savior. And they're going to have a national salvation because they're going to call out to him in repentance. That's when Jesus comes. I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. <clears throat> it's true for the nation. It's true for individuals that it's in returning to God and resting in his promises that we are saved. Especially on this side of the cross where God displayed publicly the extent of his love for fallen humanity. That's what we see on the cross. We make a fatal error in mistaking God's patience and long-suffering for his approval. In Amos' third vision, he sees the Lord standing on a wall with a plumb line in his hand, And there in chapter 7, verse 8, he says, <clears throat> Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people, Israel. I will not pass by them anymore. He's not going to pass by them. He's not going to pass over them as he once did. Rather, he will pass through them in judgment as he had once passed through Egypt. <clears throat> in the vision, Yahweh stands on the wall and he drops the objective measure of truth into the midst of his people. Now the plumb line It only knows how to do one thing, and that's respond to gravity. The objective measure, in this case, the law of Moses, it does one thing. It responds to objective truth. That's really the only kind of truth there is. God's truth. There's not your version of truth and my version of truth or what I think is truth. God's truth is objective. It is what it is. If you deny this fact, 
you will descend into absurdity. Just, <laughs> just listen to the public discourse in, in our culture. It's absurdity. That's where we're at. And how did we get there? We, just like Israel of old, we despise the law of the Lord and have not kept his commandments. It's just that simple. The plumb line shows what's straight and what's crooked, and the wall of Israel is leaning and will have to be torn down. The wall that they built is crooked because their hearts are crooked. A nation is only as righteous and just as the people that make it up. Like John Adams said at the time of the, found, of the framing of the American Constitution, our Constitution, which, by the way, is an experiment in self-government. We've been experimenting with this for almost 250 years. Our Constitution, John Adams said, was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. This is one of the philosophical princi principles of the founding of our nation. That men can only be free when they're in subjection to the highest moral authority, to God's law. In subjecting yourself to God, you find freedom. You know, Jesus said the same thing. He said, if you try to hold on to your life, you lose it. If you lose your life for my sake, you, you find it. The abundance of life is in walking with God in obedience to his word. The plumb line shows up what's straight and what's crooked, and it sounds the depths of the human heart. Yahweh says, behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. The Hebrew word is kereb. The middle. It can also be translated the inward part. The seat of the thoughts and emotions. The place where God desires to be enthroned in each one of us. Psalm 51 sure you're familiar with this. Psalm 51.10, David says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Kereb. Renew a steadfast spirit within my innermost being. The plumb line of God God's word applies the moral test and whatever does not conform to it standard well that's going to be destroyed in Isaiah 28 verse 17 Yahweh says this I will make justice the measuring line and righteousness the plummet and the hail will sweep away the refuge of lies. I will make justice the measuring line. And righteousness the plummet. That's a plummet. That's a plumb bob right there. It's one of my favorite tools, by the way. The hail will sweep away the refuge of lies. So again, you know, we, we see this all through Scripture. We have the pairing of righteousness and justice. In this instance, they become, in Isaiah 28, God's instrumentation that reveals the true condition of the national life. The plummet, the plumb bob of righteousness, 
the measuring line of justice. Tzedakah, that's righteousness. The moral gravity or weight of God's righteous character. I'm going to do that again for you. Tzedakah. That weight of God's character stretching out the line of justice, mishpat, which is the steps that are taken to produce tzedakah. What does God require of a nation? He requires righteousness and justice. Righteousness is that rightness with God, rightness between men and man and man, rightness, a right relation with God and man. That's what he wants. Justice are the steps that are taken to get there. That mishpat, justice, it's the perfect perpendicular that Israel's wall failed to achieve. The prophet Ezekiel uses the wall analogy to describe the failure of God's people in chapter 13. Ezekiel chapter 13. You know, you really should read this whole chapter. It's good, but I'm not going to, you know, we'll run out of time if I do. I'm just going to start at verse 13. You'll get the idea. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will cause a stormy wind to break forth in my fury. And there shall be a, f a flooding rain in my anger and great hailstones in fury to consume it. Oh, ha hailstones again. You know, Isaiah, he was talking about the hailstones, wasn't he? It's almost like these guys stood in the same council to get their message. So I will break down the wall you have plastered with untempered mortar and bring it down to the ground so that its foundation will be uncovered. It will fall and you shall be consumed in the midst of it. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Thus will I accomplish my wrath on the wall and on those who have plastered it with untempered mortar. And I will say to you, the wall is no more, nor those who plastered it. That is, the prophets of Israel who prophesy concerning Jerusalem and who see visions of peace for her when there is no peace, says the Lord God. False prophets, false priests. Jeroboam, the first, the first Jeroboam, who's the first king of Israel, he went in the way of Cain. He set up an alternate system of worship for the northern kingdom because he cared more about his political future than he did about his eternal future. He set up alternate altars with golden calves. He anointed an alternate priesthood he created alternate religious festivals. This was a substitute. Because he was afraid he was going to lose his control over his people, that they were going to leave the northern kingdom and go to the southern kingdom to worship because that was the place where Yahweh has said, I will set my name. That was the place that they were ordered in the, you know, directed in the, uh, the law of Moses to come to offer their sacrifices. The temple at Jerusalem, there's only one altar in the Mosaic Covenant. The one in Jerusalem. He built a crooked wall. And none of the kings of Israel that succeeded him ever tried to reform it. None of them. They were all bad kings. Southern Kingdom had some good kings, some bad kings. You know, they went back and forth. 
They'd build up the altars and a good king would come and tear them down. But not in the north. And the false priests who were no more than political appointees daubed the wall with untempered mortar that could never stand the hailstones of God's wrath. They whitewashed a mechanically unsound structure and thought it looked pretty good. Looks good on the outside. Jesus said something about whitewashed tombs, didn't he? They thought it looked pretty good, and then Amos came along <laughs> and reigned on their rig religious parade. Verse 9, we're in chapter 7 of Amos. Verse 9 says, well, first he says, I will not pass by them anymore. The high places of Isaac, another term for the northern kingdom, shall be desolate. And the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. I will rise with the sword against the house of Jeroboam. The judgment of God is coming upon their concocted system of worship. And upon the house or posterity of Jeroboam. Now this would be Jeroboam number two. Quite a few kings between Jer Jeroboam one and Jeroboam two. We're talking the middle of the eighth century. Uh, the uh, eight hundredth century, yeah. Eighth century, eighth century. I don't know how you say that? Amos predicts the throne of the northern kingdom will be cut off, and you know what? It was in seven twenty two B C. Amos is engaging in some sacred cow tipping. And whose ox is being gored is this guy, Amaziah, in verse 10. Verse 10 says, Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. Uh, for thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive from their own land. Amaziah was the high priest of Bethel. One of the center, Bethel was one of the centers of idolatrous worship. He was the priest of the calf. Remember Jeroboam set up golden calves at at Bethel and at Dan. He said, these are your gods, O Israel, that delivered you out of Egypt. You know, the same thing that Aaron said back in the wilderness. Amaziah was a false priest because he wasn't of the tribe of Levi, most likely. None of these guys were, none of these priests in the northern kingdom because, you know, Jeroboam had... Uh, anointed priests but they weren't from the tribe of Levi they were just from the common tribes but anointing signifies the empowering of the Holy Spirit which they didn't have these false priests they didn't have the Holy Spirit so a better word would be appointed. Amaziah's sacred cow is being tipped over and his own personal revenue stream is being threatened and his reaction shows that he's merely a political appointee. He's not a priest of Yahweh. He's in the wrong place to be a priest of Yahweh. No official Levite priest would be there at that altar with a golden calf.
Remember Micah's description of the elite ruling class? We've read this a couple of times. The, the elite ruling class of Israel, Micah 3.11 says, Her heads judge for a bribe, her priests teach for pay. That's Amaziah, for sure. And her prophets divine for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, Is not the Lord among us? No harm can come upon us. You know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. This is just a picture of fallen human nature. God has sent his prophet to call the nation back to, the covenant, to covenant faithfulness and to warn them of impending judgment if they don't. Prophets represent God to the people. Priests Represent the people to God. But as Amaziah shows himself to be nothing but a hireling. A person in right relation to God stands in the truth, speaks the truth, and entrusts himself to God to be his protection and support. But Amaziah went running to the king, didn't he? When he saw his, his little world that he had built up there, his little business that he was running. When it was threatened, did he go to God? No, he didn't go to God. That's not his strength and, you know, source of power. He went running to the king, King Jeroboam II. He has to appeal to political power because he has no spiritual power. He has no spiritual power because his heart is set on the wrong thing. Godliness with contentment is great gain in 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, but not the kind of gain false teachers crave. We got them around today. Huh. Send in your seed offering. So to protect his money, prestige, and power, he runs to the prince and accuses Amos of fomenting insurrection against him. Amos has conspired against you, Jeroboam, in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. This is classic Satan. Classic Satan. Satan is called the accuser of the brethren in Revelation 12.10. And this is one of his devices to project one's own sins onto another. Amaziah is the political animal, but he charges Amos with political intrigue, conspiracy, even insinuates an assassination attempt against Jeroboam. He's playing dirty politics and then accuses Amos of it. You know, that, that's something that we see in our political class today, you know. Proje they project onto the other party the things that they do. It's just Satan. He's been doing this from the beginning. Verse 11 says, But thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive from their own land. That's not exactly what Amos said. Look up here in verse 9. He said, I will rise with a sword against the house of Jeroboam. There might be a little twisting of God's word going on here. Amos was predicting the death of the nation. You know, the end of the, th the throne. Amaziah turned that into the death of Jeroboam himself. He says, Jeroboam shall die by the sword. Which might have been true, but <laughs> it wasn't exactly the way Amos put it. If 
if your aim is to get Amos kicked out of the country or better yet killed, that, that's a good political strategy. You know, they tried to use the power of the state against Jeremiah to get him to shut up. This is in Jeremiah 26. I'm just going to read 9 through 15. Why have you prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without an inhabitant? And all the people were gathered against Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. When the princes of Judah heard these things, they came up from the king's house to the house of the Lord and sat down in the entry of the new gate in, uh, of the Lord's house. And the priests and the prophets spoke to the princes and all the people, saying, This man deserves to die, for he has prophesied against this city, as you have heard with your ears. Then Jeremiah spoke to all the princes and all the people, saying, the Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and against this city with all the words that you have heard. Now, therefore, amend your ways. I love these prophets. You, you, can't, you can't get them down. They're full of the Holy Spirit. Amend your ways and your doings and obey the voice of the Lord your God. Then the Lord will relent concerning the doom that he has pronounced against you. As for me, here I am. In your hand, do with me as seems good and proper to you. But know for a certain that if you put me to death, you will surely bring innocent blood on yourselves, on this city, and on its inhabitants. For truly, the Lord has sent me to you to speak all these words in your hearing. Didn't work against him. The Sanhedrin used this tactic against Jesus in order to have him executed. You know, they'd already made up their mind they had to get rid of him. They had lost the power of capital punishment to the Romans somewhere around 6 AD. Luke 23 tells this story. Jesus was before the Sanhedrin and Chapter 23 of Luke, starting in verse 1, says, Then the whole multitude of them, the Sanhedrin, arose and led him to Pilate. They began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ a king. Then Pilate asked him, uh, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him and said, it is as you say. So Pilate said to the chief priests in the crowd, I find no fault in this man. But they were the more fierce, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee to this place. Later on, they upped the ante a little bit. They told Pilate, <clears throat> If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar's. This tactic was also used by the Jewish elders against the Apostle Paul before Felix, the Roman governor, was in Acts 24. Verses 5 through 9. We have found this man a plague, a creator of dissension among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Did you know our sect has a ringleader? It was Paul. He even tried to profane the temple, and we seized him and wanted to judge him according to our law, but the commander Lysias came by and with great violence took him out of our hands commanding his accusers to come to you. By examining him yourself, you may ascertain all these things which we, of which we accuse him. And the Jews also asserted, maintaining that these things were so.
You can't separate spiritual realities from political realities or the intersection of the two. Behind the political struggles that we see in this physical world is a spiritual conflict. That spiritual conflict has been waged ever since the first man fell from innocence. It's a battle for the minds and hearts of men. Amaziah's only weapon was the power of the state, while Amos had the bold proclamation of the word of truth, which is mighty to the pulling down of Satan's strongholds. Verse 12 says, like in uh, Amos chapter 7, Then Amaziah said to Amos, Go, you seer, flee to the land of Judah, there eat bread, and there prophesy, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is the royal residence. <laughs> Is that all you got? <laughs> there is nothing stronger than the truth. It always wins in the marketplace of ideas. Just give it time. The days are numbered of those whose only defense is to silence their opposition. Boy, don't we see that going on today. Chicken. <laughs> That's what they are. They're chicken. They can't stand up in the marketplace of ideas and win because they don't have the truth. The truth has to be silenced. It has to be snuffed out. Amaziah says to Amos, go, you seer. The word seer puts the emphasis on the seer of visions aspect of Amos's ministry. Flee to the land of Judah, there eat bread and there prophesy, but never again prophesy at Bethel. In other words, get out, don't come back. We don't want to hear what you've got to say, so we're kicking you off of Twitter. Never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, the king's chapel or the king's temple. And it is the royal residence, it's the court. Do you hear what Amaziah is saying here? There is no authority higher than our earthly king. There are no laws above the laws that we make. We can craft a religion that suits us because really there's no God. There's no God. I have an article here. I don't usually do this, but I'm going to read this, parts of this. Can't tell from that clock. It doesn't work anymore. This is uh, dated March 1st. This is from um, Family Research Council. The author is Tony Perkins. And the, uh, the title is Nadler on God. He's no concern to this Congress. I'm going to read just parts of this for you. There were a lot of powerful arguments against the Equality Act, but Representative Greg, I don't know how to say his name, it's either Stuba or Stubi, or if it was German, it would be Stoibe. Representative from Florida resorted to the ultimate authority, the Bible. Oh, no, he did that in Congress? During an intense debate on the House floor, the Florida representative said it was time for his colleagues to hear the truth about the transgender issue, but Democrats aren't interested in the truth or God. And far, and far left radical Jerry Nadler, Democrat New York, didn't mind saying so. A woman must not wear men's clothing, nor a man wear women's clothing, for the Lord your God detests anyone who does this. Stuba said, from Deuteronomy 22, 5, 
But let's be clear, he said, it's not clothing or personal style that offends God, but rather the use of one's appearance to act out or take on a sexual identity different from the one biologically assigned by God at birth. No, he didn't say that, did he? What's happening when men, women, and children do that, Stuba said, is that they're making a statement that God didn't know what he was doing when he created them. And if Congress supports that by passing extreme transgender bills like the Equality Act, then this country is going directly against what is laid out in Scripture. Democrats, irate that the Florida congressman dared to quote the word of God on the House floor, unleashed on Stuba. Everyone from Representative Al Green, Democrat, Texas, to Catherine Clark, Democrat, Massachusetts, shamed him for being transphobic and intolerant. But it was Congressman Nadler's response that was the most shocking and revealing. Mr. Stuba, he said pointedly, what any religious tradition describes as God's will is no concern of this Congress. In other words, take your God and your Bible and leave them out of this. Almost immediately, a picture of Nadler started circulating on social media with the line, God has no authority in the House of Representatives at the top. It was a paraphrase of Nadler's comment, but a legitimate expression of his belief and the left's, which is that there's no room for God in public policy. Not surprisingly, the fact checkers rushed to Nadler's defense, insisting that he'd, been, he'd said nothing of the kind. I highlighted a bunch of more of this, but we, you get the idea, okay? There's nothing new under the sun. Representative Nadler and his ilk would love to cut this nation loose from its foundation, which means destroy it, by the way. And then build it back again, remake it according to the dictates of their own warped worldview, which is nothing more than the agenda of Antichrist. Nothing more. It's so plain. I mean, the differences are so stark, night and day. You know, who can object? Who can argue that? That's the agenda of Antichrist. Verse fourteen. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor a son of a prophet, but I was a sheep breeder and a tender of sycamore fruit, a fig picker. Then the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Amos says, I didn't volunteer for this job. I wasn't seeking it. I wasn't trained for it. You know, the, these, the son of a prophet, that, that means uh, not that your daddy was a prophet. It means a member of the prophet's guild, the school of the prophets. You know, the, this school of the prophets crops up in, I think, I think the first time you see it is during the time of Samuel. And that's what it was. It was a school of prophets, you know, up and coming prophets. Amos says, I didn't go to prophet school. I didn't go to seminary. I wasn't educated to be a prophet. God took me. You know, I was happily leading my flock of sheep one minute, and the next thing I know, God was commissioning me to travel up here and deliver this message to you. So here it is. Listen up. Yeah, I like this guy. <laughs> Verse 16. Now, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. You say, do not prophesy against Israel and do not spout against 
the house of Isaac. We've looked at this word before. It means don't drip on us. Don't rain on our parade. Amaziah's got a good thing going here. You're messing it up. Do not spout against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus says the Lord, your wife shall be a harlot in the city. Your sons and daughters shall fall by the sword. Your land shall be divided by survey line. You shall die in a defiled land, and Israel shall surely be led away captive from his own land. I said it before, I say it again. Israel is going to be carried away captive. So what do you say about Amaziah? You know, I just say he made the wrong choice. He traded away eternal salvation to try to hold on to fleeting temporal things like money, power, prestige. He exalted himself above the Almighty. He stood in direct opposition to what God was doing. He tried to impede God's message by silencing the prophet. And so he had to hear his own particular part of the prophecy. His wife would, it literally says, go a whoring in the city, probably after the city fell to the Assyrians. His children would be killed by the enemy. His inheritance in the land would be parceled out to others whom the Assyrians brought in. They always did that. When they conquered a people, they would, they would exile the people of the land and bring in other people. Just keep everything mixed up. It makes people easier to control. And he, Amaziah, would be carried off to die in a Gentile land. And worst of all, Amaziah had to hear this from a shepherd. Let's pray. Lord, these are exciting times. And we're always uh, just blown away how contemporary your word is. And, well, that makes sense because there really is nothing new under the sun. Human nature doesn't change. We look at Israel and their failures and we understand that we are subject to the same fallacies. We see history repeating itself time and time again. But there's something else that never changes and that's your love, your mercy, your faithfulness, and your grace. You've blessed us beyond all comprehension. So we just want to yield our hearts and our lives to you. We ask that you would equip us to go out into this world and engage our culture with the gospel of Jesus Christ. You said all power on heaven and earth is given to you. And it's in that power and it's in that name that we go to make disciples. Bless us now, Lord, as we depart this place and make us your faithful servants. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand, church.
Let's always remember that church that the glory is God's alone. He loves us so much. Get excited about tomorrow, 72 degrees. But next week's going to be 40, so sorry to break your party there. (laughs) Hey, have a blessed week. We'll see you Sunday, Lord willing. Drive safe.